Our next guest has been accurately forecasting higher inflation for quite some time. It's finally hit us. We're almost at double digits, but not quite. We'll get us take today. Peter Schiff is the chief strategist at Euro Pacific Asset Management and the CEO of Euro Pacific Gold uh, and Schiff Gold. Welcome back to the show. Oh, thanks, David, for having me on. And, you oh, know, first of all, yeah. it, it, I, on the introduction, you know, we've had the inflation for years. The Fed has been creating inflation. They just call it quantitative easing. But what they're really doing is creating inflation. What finally happened recently is that all that inflation showed up in a very big way in consumer prices. I mean, it was there before. It just wasn't as obvious because the increases weren't as big and the government did its best to cover them up with a highly rigged CPI that has been understating the rate at which prices have been rising for years. And yeah. by the way, we are in double digit price increases if we accurately measured those increases. It's only because of the inaccurate measurement that we're using, the CPI, that we're still under 10%. But if we measured prices today the way we measured them back in the 80s, because we often want to compare today's inflation mm -hmm. to the 80s and 70s, it's actually north of 15%. It's actually worse than any year of the 1970s. I spoke to an economist about that, uh, Steve Henke. I asked him, why is it that people are complaining about the government's underreporting inflation? This is his answer. I want, to com I want you to comment on that. He says, maybe we're just outliers. Maybe our spending patterns are different from the average Joe's. And so <laughs> what we notice is an increase in double digits of whatever we usually consume. Maybe you and I, Peter, just have an expensive <laughs> lifestyle is basically his answer. <laughs> what do you, how do you, how do you, how would you respond to that? Yeah, well, it's just that the government statisticians live in a fantasy world yeah. and the average American lives in reality. But no, the, the, the answer to the question is we deliberately changed the CPI. I mean, nobody pays owner's equivalent rent. So why does the government use a number that no American pays as the largest component of the CPI? Why not use actual rent, the rent that people pay? Because that number is triple or quadruple this number that the government has concocted. Or why not use house prices that are actually going up more than rents? Because people actually buy houses and they mm -hmm. have to pay those prices. And they've made other changes to the CPI that did not exist uh, prior. All the substitution uh, where the basket is not the same, but it constantly changes. They take out the stuff that went up and they put stuff in that went down or didn't go up as much. And they have ways of hedonically adjusting things. So they claim that prices didn't go up when they did or claim that prices went down when they went up because they're making a subjective assessment of quality. But oftentimes I think they reduce prices when quality goes up, but they don't increase them when quality goes down. So you have an issue with the components of the CPI. Okay, that's understandable. So why do you think they're doing that? Let's assume you're right and they're underreporting what inflation should be. Do you think there's maybe a political incentive to underreport CPI? Well, well, of course. You know, I mean, my dad used to say trusting the government to give you accurate information on inflation is like trusting the mafia to give you accurate information. Was on your dad crime. Russian? Did he live in Russia? Well, no. Well, no. I, well, actually, uh, his uh, uh, parents uh, were from there, uh, yeah. but he was born in um, in the United States. But but the point is, look, the government has every reason to understate inflation. In fact, when they first did it, it had to do uh, with the budget. They were trying to reduce spending on Social Security and Medicare, but no politician had the guts to actually reduce uh, Social Security or Medicare. So they found a way to reduce the COLAs so that they wouldn't be increasing them by the true rate of inflation. And so they changed the methodology for calculating inflation. So it enabled the government to cut spending without officially voting to cut spending. So that's what it's how it started. But, you know, it, it delivers all sorts of benefits to the government because by understating inflation, you also overstate growth because whenever they take the GDP numbers, they use an inflation rate 
to deflate it, the GDP deflator, because they want to show what's happening to the real economy and take inflation out. And so when you pretend that inflation is lower than it actually is, it makes it appear that the economy is growing faster than it actually is. And all politicians want to take credit for economic growth. And so by lying about inflation and underreporting it, they can pretend the economy is much stronger than it actually is. But more recently, it's the Federal Reserve that's been able to hide behind these doctored inflation figures as a pretense to continue its reckless monetary policy. The Fed has been able to justify 0% interest rates in QE on the basis of inflation still being below their 2% target, which first of all, 2% was never a target. It was supposed to be a ceiling. It wasn't like if inflation was 1%, they had to get it up to 2%, but they turned the ceiling into a target in order to pursue an inflationary monetary policy but inflation was never too low. That was just a canard. That was just a false excuse for the Fed to do what it wanted to do, which was to prop up government spending, to continue to blow air into a bubble, to artificially push up stock prices and real estate prices. But it didn't want to admit that was its goal. So it came up with this ridiculous goal of that there not being enough inflation and trying to raise the inflation rate. Well, all the years the Fed was pretending this was their goal, I was warning what was going to happen when they overshot. Because eventually I said the official numbers would be much, much higher than 2%. And then the Fed would be in a box because it would be impossible to ever bring the rate of inflation back down to 2% without completely destroying the bubble economy that low interest rates and QE had inflated. We're going to come back to uh, how they're going to fix this problem if there is a solution. But first, let's talk about the root causes of this problem that we're in. Now, you've talked about uh, how asset prices have moved up first before CPI, and that was correct. And you've talked about uh, how monetary policy, the failed monetary policies of the Fed, have created this problem. Let me ask you this, Peter. QE is not a new phenomenon. We've had QE before in the early 2000s. Why didn't we have higher CPI back then? Why, why did it happen only this time around? Well, first of all, I think we did have higher inflation back then. And in fact, had the government not done QE, we may have actually had falling prices in 2009 or 2010. It was the Great Recession, so prices probably should have come down. But because of all the inflation we created, they went up instead. And of course, they went up by more than the government admits because we're still looking at the CPI. But the reason it's so much worse now than it was back then is because we've printed so much more money. Look at the enormity of the QE program subsequent to uh, COVID. And you know, look at the number of dollars that have been put into circulation over the past couple of years. A lot of the QE that was done you know, following the financial crisis was mainly focused in the financial economy. So you saw a much bigger impact on asset prices like stocks and real estate. But this time around, the government sent all these checks directly to the people that they went and spent. In fact, the worst thing they did, and I pointed this out real time, is they told people not to go to work and to stay home. In fact, in many cases, people were ordered not to work and to stay home. So people couldn't produce goods. They couldn't produce services. Their spending should have gone down because they weren't producing as much, so they should have spent less. And that would have meant a recession, of course, but the politicians didn't want that. So they told the workers who were taking a vacation, we're gonna send you money. In fact, we're gonna give you more money than you used to earn when you had a job, even though you're staying at home, and we want you to go out and spend that money. Well, spend it on what? Nobody was making anything. So when you make less stuff, but you print more money to buy stuff, Prices have got nowhere to go but way up because the government didn't create any stuff. They just printed more money to buy stuff. And the other reason that the inflation was not as big is because we were able to export the inflation to our trading partners. We run these enormous trade deficits, which are now at all-time record highs. They've just blown through the roof as far as the size of these deficits. We take the money the Fed prints and we send it over to China, and the Chinese send us all the goods that they produce. And they take those dollars and they buy treasuries or things like that. But so that helps keep a lid on consumer prices, 
but it also helps reduce interest rates and prop up stock prices. So we've benefited from that. But I think that dynamic is going to change. I think a lot of the money we've exported is going to come back and prices are going to be bid up even faster. Okay. Uh, Let's talk about uh, asset prices in response to inflation. Let's assume the markets are as smart as you, Peter. Let's assume that everybody isn't buying into the uh, government numbers that you claim are inaccurate. I'm actually, you're not the only person to say this. A lot of people agree with you. So let's assume the governments are underreporting inflation. Let's assume the markets know about this. If I'm an analyst and I'm analyzing a stock, I'm making a dec- I'm making a discounted cash flow analysis on a stock. I'm not going to use 7.9% inflation to project higher costs for next year. I'm going to use 12% or 15%, whatever the case may be that I think is a reasonable number. And so the stock should be, uh, you know, valued lower because their margins should be shrinking based on these higher cost numbers. Is that what's happening right now? Do you think markets are accurately pricing in inflation? No, I don't think they're accurately pricing it in yet. I think the markets are still delusional with respect to inflation. I think most analysts still expect that what we're seeing is transitory. Uh, They just think the transition is taking longer uh, than they first thought. They still think the inflation is driven by supply chain bottlenecks or uh, the war with Russia and Ukraine. And so they think that all this stuff is going to unclog and prices are going to magically uh, stop rising. But that's not going to happen. I mean, the inflation is being caused by the government, by the Federal Reserve. And I see the budget deficits and the trade deficits getting bigger and bigger. And so the Federal Reserve is going to continue to create more inflation. And even though the Fed has raised interest rates, they're still at a quarter of a percent. Inflation, even if you buy the government's version of inflation, that is 8%, how are you going to put out 8% inflation fire with a squirt gun of one quarter of 1% interest rate? I mean, that's never worked. Interest rates are historically negative. I mean, Paul Volcker in 1980, to, to, to finally get rid of inflation, rates went to 20%. The highest inflation got in 1980 was 13.5%. So he had 6.5% real rates to bend the inflation curve. How are we going to bend that curve when we have negative 7.5% interest rates? There is no incentive to change your spending and borrowing and consumption patterns with a negative 7.5% rate. It's not like people are going to be incentivized to start saving now because they want to earn that negative 7.5%. Of course not. People aren't going to stop borrowing, even though they're getting paid 7.5% to borrow. A negative interest rate means you're being paid to go out and take out a loan. So people are going to keep doing that. Nothing is going to change. Inflation is going to keep getting worse. The Fed is actually pursuing an inflationary monetary policy under the guise of fighting inflation. You know, just because you're less loose than you were before doesn't mean you're tight. And of course, you're not even less loose because inflation is accelerating faster than the Fed is hiking rates. So rates in real terms are actually lower today than they were many, many months ago when the Fed first started contemplating the first quarter point rate hike. That's right. Real rates are still negative. All right. So let's talk about Fed's uh, policy. What can they do to, to, to fight inflation, assuming they even are interested in really fighting inflation? You've tweeted this, and I'm just going to read one of your tweets from yesterday. You said, Powell admitted price stability is so important to the long-term health of the labor market that the Fed may have to keep hiking interest rates to bring inflation down, even if unemployment rises. The same would apply to asset prices falling. This resolve will soon be tested. All right, what do you mean by that? Are you saying that uh, it's, it's either or, either the labor market or inflation? We can't have both? Well, the economy that we have today, and I call it a bubble, it's a phony economy, it is completely dependent on artificially low interest rates, on all this credit, credit financed uh, consumption and, and, and wealth that comes from inflated asset prices. So we've got this drugged up economy and we need to remove the drug. Well, you can't do that without collapsing the economy. It's like, you know, if you're high on drugs, is there any way that you could kick the habit and stay high? No. I mean, you stop taking the drugs, you're not going to be high anymore. You're going to go through withdrawal. So yes, the Fed can fight inflation. 
if it wants to. But if it fights inflation, it's going to have to collapse this bubble economy that was built on its cheap money. Because you can't fight inflation with cheap money. You've got to take the cheap money away. And interest rates have to rise dramatically, not just a little bit. They have to go way up. And the government has to really start shrinking the money supply or the Federal Reserve. They have to start reversing quantitative easing. They can't just slowly allow their balance sheet to run down. And by the way, look at their latest numbers. The week just ended on Wednesday. The Fed added another $45 billion to the balance sheet and set a new record high. They continue to monetize government debt. You can't do that if you want to fight inflation. That is creating additional inflation. So the only way that the Fed can truly fight inflation is to allow a massive recession, a complete collapse of this phony economy, and it's going to force the U.S. government to make some hard fiscal decisions that it's never made because it's not going to be able to finance its deficits if the Fed is fighting inflation. So we're going to either have to have massive cuts in government spending, including entitlements like Social Security and Medicare. We're going to have to have massive increases in taxes on the middle class, not on the rich, on the middle class, working Americans or some combination of that. Or the government might have to default on its treasury obligations. These are the things that the government's going to have to consider if the Fed were to actually fight inflation, which is why I don't believe the Fed. I don't think the Fed's going to fight inflation. In fact, if they were going to fight it, they would have already done it. We wouldn't still be at 25 basis points in interest rates. They wouldn't have finally raised interest rates on Wednesday if they were committed to fighting inflation. They would have done it a long time ago. They wouldn't have continued quantitative easing when it was obvious that we had an inflation problem. I mean, even after they admitted that they got it wrong and inflation was not transitory, they kept printing money. They kept monetizing debt. They kept interest rates at zero. So I don't care what the Fed says. I look at what the Fed does, and their actions speak a lot louder than their words. Okay, let's... You know what? Let's assume that the Fed is going to take your plan and say, we're going to really hike up rates to a level where a default may actually be necessary. I'm not saying they will, but let's just say that happens. What's going to happen to the stock markets? What's going to happen to gold in that scenario? Well, the stock market is certainly going to crash. There's no question about that. The bond market is going to crash. The real estate market is going to crash. Right? All of these assets that have been propped up by artificially low interest rates are going to collapse. Now, what happens to gold prices, it's hard to say. I mean, gold prices could go down in that scenario, but they would go down a lot less than stocks, bonds, and real estate. So people would still be better off in gold than owning these other assets. But personally, I think if we got to a situation where the U.S. government was defaulting on its debt, I think that would be very bullish for gold. I think people would be rushing out of dollars and out of U.S. treasuries, and they would be seeking out the safety of gold. So I think kind of gold's going to go up either way, but gold will go up a lot more if we don't do that. If instead we inflate our way out of it, if we never uh, fight inflation because we don't want to deal with those consequences, if we keep on printing money and monetizing government debt, then gold prices are going to go up much more. I mean, maybe stock prices will go up in that environment too, but in real terms, they'll go down even more priced in gold than in the alternative scenario where we do the right thing and everything crashes. Okay, let's touch on gold real quick. Just have one question about gold. You've mentioned that inflation has been rising for quite a while. Why is it that gold hasn't moved until actually relatively recently? In the last couple of months, it's moved up, but still it hasn't breached its August 2020 high. So what's going on there? Well, first of all, you have to put everything in its context and and kind of zoom out a little bit and look at the gold market. Because in in 2001, gold was under 300. So it went on a very big move from 2001 to 2011, from under 300 to almost 2000. I mean, it got to over 1900. And then we went on a substantial correction where gold dropped from 1900 almost back to 1000 by December of 2015. So that's when the market stopped falling. And that was coincidentally when the Fed hiked rates for the first time after having held them at zero for for many years. And that actually marked the bottom in that correction. And so then gold gradually basically doubled in price over the years. And so it has been going up. It's just that everybody wants to compare it to its peak in 2011 and forgets where it came from 
10 years <coughs> earlier than that. But I think one of the reasons that we haven't seen a bigger move up in gold yet is because we've had a speculative mania in, in risk assets. I mean, I think 2021 really was the peak. If you look at what happened you know, with the meme stocks, NFTs, cryptocurrencies, the popularity of all the crypto gurus, uh, stock market gurus like Kathy Wood and her ARK Innovation uh, ETFs and things like that, investors really threw caution to the wind. They didn't care about fundamentals. They bought anything that was going up. Everybody was going to get rich speculating. That's not an environment where gold's going to shine. I mean, people weren't worried about anything. They didn't need a store of value or a safe haven. They didn't need an inflation hedge. They wanted to get rich quick. And that's mm -hmm. not what gold is about. So I think in that environment, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that we didn't see a lot of interest in gold. But as the air is coming out of those bubbles, which I think is going to be happening, I think 2021 was the peak of crazy speculation. And as it starts to move from an environment of greed to an environment of fear, as reality rears its ugly head and people finally realize that inflation is here to stay. Because at first people said there's no inflation at all. Then they said, okay, we've got inflation, uh, but it's transitory. And then they said, okay, it's not transitory, but don't worry, the Fed's gonna quickly rein it in. Once they realize that that's a lie too, that the Fed is not going to reduce inflation, that inflation is here to stay and it's going to get worse, well, that's when you're really going to see people piling into gold. Okay, so gold's going to go higher. What do you think inflation's going to do? You've already called for higher inflation. We've got higher inflation. Is it going to go much higher, Peter? What about next month's reading? Is it going to be higher than 7.9, you think? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, so no, I can't nobody tell. does. Yeah, but obviously next month's is going to be higher because it's going to capture the big price increases in March. So, I mean, most people expect the March number to be pretty hot. Uh, but again, you know, I wouldn't put it past the government to find a way to alter the CPI again to find some other way of calculating these price increases uh, to make them appear that they're smaller than they really are. But you know. The real inflation that everybody experiences is going to get worse. I was saying last year that 2022 was going to be worse than 2021 because I know in 2021, a lot of businesses were absorbing their cost increases and not fully passing them on or not passing them on at all because a lot of businesses were also convinced that this was transitory. And so they just waited it out. They said, you know, why should we bother hiking all of our prices when this is just temporary. You know, we'll just take a hit in the short run to our margins. We don't want to risk losing customers to competitors. And so we'll just eat it. But now in 2022, that they realize that they were mistaken, that inflation was not transitory, that it's permanent and going to get worse. Not only are they raising prices to reflect what's happening in 2022, but they're trying to catch up to what they missed in 2021. So now consumers are going to get hit uh, with, a, with a double dose of price increases. And so I think that 2022, uh, you know, if accurately measured, yeah. is going to be higher inflation than 2021. And I think that would have been the case regardless of, of Russia uh, invading the Ukraine. So final question on inflation, and then we'll finish on the economy. What do we do then? Let's assume you're right, higher inflation in 2022. Where do we go to hedge against this? I know you're not going to say Bitcoin, because Bitcoin actually has been performing <laughs> rather poorly in light of recent geopolitical developments and higher inflation. So crypto is a site. Where else can we go? Yeah, well, you have to remember, crypto is part of the bubble. It's part of the mania in risk assets. I mean, probably the riskiest assets of all are these cryptocurrencies, because they're all worthless. Uh, but people are willing to buy them. And so it's just this greater fool game. Uh, but I think that all that is going to implode now that we're going to have rising inflation and rising interest rates. I mean, the Fed is going to have to raise rates, even though they're not going to raise them enough to bring down inflation. They'll raise them enough to prick these bubbles. Yeah. And I think that investors are going to start looking at fundamentals again in an inflationary world. 
They're not going to be betting on the come. They're not going to be buying stocks that might have earnings in 10 or 20 years. They're going to be buying stocks that have earnings right now and that are paying dividends. In particular, they're going to buy stocks in companies that have pricing power so they can raise their prices to recover their costs and pay higher dividends to their shareholders. I think people are going to be looking at the stock market as an inflation hedge and only buying those stocks that hedge you against inflation. And these overpriced tech stocks or cryptocurrencies or any of that, they're not a hedge against inflation. Right. They're speculation when you don't have any inflation. And I do think the world is going to be looking more for real things, resources, whether it's industrial metals or precious metals, agricultural uh, commodities, energy, things like that. And I think the world's going to be moving out of the U.S. internationally. That already started before uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. I think that temporarily halted that, 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 that trend, but that trend is going to continue because if you want value, you don't invest in the U.S. We've got all the hyped up momentum. You've got much better value stocks, dividend paying stocks outside the United States than inside. And I think the emerging markets are going to be particular beneficiaries relative to developed markets because I think all of this uh, is going to result in a much weaker U.S. dollar relative to other currencies. And emerging markets will be Uh, the bigger beneficiaries of a weaker dollar, there will be more capital flows into their economies, into their markets. It will result in greater increases in living standards in those countries as living standards are declining in the U.S. because uh, consumers in emerging economies with their strengthening currencies will be able to consume more of what they produce rather than sending their production to the United States so that Americans can consume what they didn't produce. And I think more of their savings will be invested locally rather than squandered on U.S. treasuries or mortgage-backed securities or whatever else they were buying with their trade surpluses. And so I think there are going to be some big winners and losers from what's about to happen. And mm -hmm. so as an investor, you want to invest with the winners and, and avoid the losers. And unfortunately, the losses are going to be here in the United States Uh, U.S. stocks and bonds, and in particular, you know, the bond market will be crushed in real terms, and all these high-flying stocks and cryptocurrencies will also come crashing down. Okay. Uh, well, looking just domestically, I'm assuming then maybe you like the uh, consumer staples, maybe things like Walmart. As things get more expensive, inflation kicks in, people need to go shop for cheaper things. Is that? I, I don't know. I'm well, just a theory. you know. I'm not that optimistic on Walmart. I mean, if you look at what Walmart is selling, I mean, all that stuff is made in China. And if the dollar collapses and all that stuff is five times as expensive, uh, you know, not that many people are going to be able to afford to buy it. So, oh. you know, I, I, I'm not that uh, optimistic on on how on how a what Walmart about? does in an environment where the dollar crashes. I mean, there there are much better investments outside the United States You know, I, I want to. I want if I'm going to own a retailer, I want to own a retailer where the customers are getting richer, not poorer, where they have more money to spend, not less. I mean, remember, Americans have been relying on an overvalued dollar and on cheap credit. That's where they get their purchasing power, not from their productivity, but from their ability to go into debt and from the dollar status as the reserve currency. Well, when interest rates go up and if the dollar loses that status, I think America's days of shopping are done. And so you have to figure out who are the new consumers going to be. And right. if you want to be in retail, then be in companies that benefit them. If I was going to invest in U.S. stocks, I would look at the U.S. stocks that have the most exposure to overseas markets that are, that are exporting real things that have goods and services that they can sell to wealthier foreign consumers and already have you know, a pipeline of doing that. I think those are the U.S. companies that will do the best. But again, I would much rather invest internationally where the valuations are much better right now and the prospects are much brighter and you get the tailwind I think, of appreciating foreign currencies. Because I think this is the dollar's last swan song right now on this uh, Russia situation. You got to bid to the dollar. But ultimately, I think the long-term ramifications of what's going on right now are very dollar negative. And the fundamentals were already dollar negative of these exploding uh, budget deficits and trade deficits. Okay, so Peter, just asking you to speculate now. I know nobody has a crystal ball, but just speculate. What do you think is the outcome of this war in Ukraine? As far as, you know, my take on the outcome of this war. I mean, I really don't know, right? I mean, I'm not that yeah. involved in 
the understanding of all the circumstances. And I'm not a you know, geopolitical strategist. I, I don't really know what's in the minds of, 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 of all the players. As a human being, I simply hope that the war comes to an end as quickly as possible, just be, be so people aren't losing their lives. I mean, I think that's the real tragedy here. So whenever there's a war, I want a speedy resolution. Whatever the, the piece is going to be, to me, I, it, I, I'm not that concerned. I just would like to see it end, right? And, 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 you know, even if you have to throw Putin a bone, you know, I don't think, you know, this is a situation where appeasing the next Adolf Hitler. I, I, I really don't think it's to that degree. But again, yeah. it's not up to me to make a decision, right? So well, uh, I, I'm not involved in it, but I do hope it ends. I think it's certainly a lot worse for Europe than it is for the United States in the short run. I think the Europeans have a much uh, greater interest economically and politically in ending it. Unfortunately, I think the Biden administration, and not that I'm making an accusation because I don't know, but from where I sit, I think it serves their purpose for this to continue. Because to me, it's a great scapegoat to blame problems on, uh, both for the Fed and for the Biden administration. You know, you don't, now you don't have to blame COVID. We have a new excuse for why prices are going up. And I do think to the extent there's a lot of concern in Europe, the U.S. benefits as a safe haven from Europe. I mentioned there was a lot of capital that was leaving the U.S. and investing in Europe before this war. And some of that now is reversed as people are coming back to the U.S. Uh, and of course, you know, we don't rely on Russian uh, gas the way Europe does. So we're in a bu much better position if we end up benefiting from capital flows. If some of our companies benefit, maybe more U.S. gas can make its way over to Europe, uh, more American gas. Maybe some of our uh, military contractors could get more orders. I don't know. But in the short run, it might benefit the U.S. for this war to continue. Mm. And, and so we may be pushing in that direction. I hope I'm wrong on that. Uh, but, you know, certainly, you know, I'm very skeptical of right. anything that governments do. They rarely tell the truth. Uh, these guys, you know, people think that I'm, I'm unethical because I, I, I tweeted about about uh, about a T-shirt. I mean, it, it, where there's a lack of ethics is in the U.S. Congress and in the U.S. White House. So I wouldn't put anything past these guys. Right. Uh, but, you know, I, you know, as 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 an American, as a, as a human being, I hope this uh, war, uh, you know, can be over today. Well, well, final but, question. You know, I, yeah. yeah. Final question. Okay. So you mentioned that the U.S. might benefit in the short term economically. What is the one everlasting economic impact of this war, even if it ends, you know, peacefully? Uh, whatever the case may be, does it doesn't matter what the end result of the war is. What is the one everlasting economic impact from this war? And we'll end the conversation there. Well, I think the economic impact for the United States which I think is, you know, a big negative for the U.S., is I think it's going to hasten the destruction of the dollar as the world's reserve currency, because I think we're putting on display the dangers of that. Because I think if you're China and you're looking at what's going on and you're seeing how the dollar has been weaponized against Russia, and you're China, and you know that, you know, the U.S. doesn't say a lot of nice things about China, and China has way more dollars than Russia did. Uh, they're way more exposed with their dollar holdings and their U.S. Treasury holdings. So uh, if the dollar can be used as a weapon against Russia, what about China? And I think China would want to disarm us, would want to take that weapon away, would want to do everything it can to hasten its move out of the U.S. dollar, uh, to get rid of those treasuries, to develop a a system that would compete with SWIFT that had nothing to do with the U.S. dollar. So we didn't have this type of weapon where we can choke off their country from its trading partners or the rest of the world. So I think the message we're sending is, hey, your dollar reserves aren't safe. And, you know, you can't trust the dollar uh, like you could something like gold. Uh, and so I think that it just is going to accelerate something that would have happened anyway. I mean, I think the dollar status... Sure was already in jeopardy and sure. we were going to lose it anyway based mm -hmm. on our fiscal profligacy and our monetary excesses. But this idea of weaponizing the dollar and, and using these sanctions just sends the wrong message if your goal is to preserve the dollar as the world's reserve currency. Thank you very much, Peter, for your time. I do appreciate it. We'll speak to you next time.
And thank you for watching Kitco News. Don't forget to tune in next Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for a live panel discussion featuring Roy Niederhofer, fund manager, and Kevin O'Leary, star of Shark Tank, moderated by Michelle McCory. We will be talking about all things to do with cryptocurrencies and the hottest investments in the crypto space right now. If you don't want to miss it, questions will be taken live from the audience.